colleagues at the Danish Institute for Parties and Democracy, uh, Demo Finland, and the Olaf Palma Center uh, for hosting this event, and also for my co-panelists, uh, Dil Toko and, and Juliet, for, uh, for joining us from different parts of, of the world. So um, as, uh, as Elizabeth just mentioned, uh, the book uh, just recently was published by uh, Oxford University Press, um, and it tries to provide a, a global perspective on this emerging um, concept of violence against women in politics. So the, the book really tries to approach this question uh, this issue through four main questions. Um, where did the concept of violence against women in politics come from? Why are we suddenly starting to talk about it as, as a phenomenon? Um, how is it different from other forms of violence in politics? Um, what does it look like in practice? And what can we do to address it? And, and really, why does it matter that we, we take active steps to, uh, to address violence against women in politics? So I'm gonna just mention um, some of my thoughts with the first questions and then really focus mainly on, on solutions. Okay, so we think about the, the concept, where did it come from? Why are we suddenly talking about, uh, about this issue? Um, so what we see uh, in my course of my research that it um, really emerged in parallel across different parts of the global South, um, really as women sought to give a name to the things that they were experiencing in, in political life. Um, and as we know, you know, as part of the feminist movement, that women's experiences with gender inequality are often problems with no name. Um, but we see this effort over the last uh, 20 years or so by women to, uh, to name it something. Um, around 2000, there was a group, um, a sort of a network of locally elected women in Bolivia who started to talk about political harassment and violence against women. Um, in the mid-2000s, a group of female activists and politicians in South Asia uh, convened some seminars to talk about violence against women in politics. And in the wake of the contested 2007 elections in Kenya, uh, practitioners and activists on the ground started to talk about the problem of electoral gender-based violence. And all of these were like slightly different ways of naming the problem, but really it tried to capture this idea that women were being targeted um, as women when they were trying to participate in, in politics. Um, around 2010, a number of international practitioners started to link these debates to point out that actually women were talking about this in different parts of the world. It was emerging organically from their experiences um, and really trying to link them um, as part of a broader problem facing women when they tried to participate in politics. Um, but at the early stages, it was really seen as an issue uh, affecting mainly countries in the global south. Um, but over the last decade, we've seen more and more women and more and more events happening in the global north that have really helped to consolidate an understanding of this as a problem that affects women everywhere in, in the world, much like the problem of violence against women, right? It affects women in all social groups, all backgrounds, all types of countries. The manifestations might look different, but it is, it's a, a, common, uh, a common barrier. Um, so we see, for example, Julie Gillard's famous misogyny speech, um, the murder of Joe Cox, uh, 2016, a British MP, um, and also the Me Too movement in 2017, which started to bring more of a, a, a global uh, a focus to sexual harassment in different spaces, including uh, political life. Um, but there are still some barriers to recognition that I think explain why it, it's an old problem, but is only newly recognized, um, but also some barriers that make it difficult to address this problem. Um, one is a cognitive gap, which is really a tendency to normalize violence and harassment as really just the cost of doing politics. Um, it's also a tendency to treat it as an individual problem rather than as a systemic issue, right? Something to do with you rather than uh, the fact of, of gender inequality. Um, we also see a political gap where women may be hesitant to speak up about it because they think it will make them look weak um, or it's sometimes seen as something that could be weaponized by, uh, by their political rivals. Um, it's also a receptivity gap in the sense that women who do speak out um, often find that they're not believed um, or they're accused of playing the gender card, right? That this isn't a real problem um, and something that uh, people should be, even be worried about. 
Um, and then finally, there's a, a resources gap, right? Um, there's really no place to go. Who would you tell? How, what would you do? Um, and also sometimes really no language to, um, to describe what those experiences are, are about, right? And so what I'm trying to do in the book is to try to help fill some of those gaps with, you know, um, all of the really wonderful work being done by uh, practitioners um, around, around the world. So in terms of um, some of the ideas, which is really like a, a synthesis and trying to sort of systematize how we think about this problem, um, I do want to just, uh, just say a word about what I understand as violence in this context. So we know that the, I guess, everyday understanding of violence tends to think about it as physical violence. Um, and this is, you know, we can think about this as more of like a minimalistic definition. Um, but there's more and more research that advocates for adopting a more comprehensive approach. So uh, scholars like Victoria Bufaki argues we think, should think about violence as a violation of integrity um, in the sense of the wholeness or intactness of the self, right? So you can have attacks on your physical integrity, but also your mental and emotional <laughs> integrity as well. Um, and this is consistent, I think, with how feminist researchers, feminist activists have long thought about violence against women, that it's something that isn't just physical violence. It exists on a broader spectrum of acts that are sort of connected, um, but also reinforce one another, right? So we can see this in like the image of the iceberg, right? That there's like some very visible forms, but others that are people less aware of, right? But they're sort of supporting the structure of, of violence. Um, so in the book, um, to help us understand why this is a bit different than other forms of violence in politics, I, I argue that there are really two phenomena um, of violence in political life. Um, so the first is violence in, in politics, and I think this is the ordinary understanding of political violence, electoral violence, that it's issue-based. Um, you attack your political opponents, um, whether it's the candidates, whether it's voters, um, activists, and, and this is a form of violence that can affect both men and women. Um, it might be higher in places where violence is more normalized, there's greater impunity, uh, maybe conflict situation. It could take gender differentiated forms, right? So um, women could be targeted for sexual violence, right? But it's really about their support for another party, right? Rather than the fact that they're women. Um, and the forms, this type of violence, the democratic costs are very, very well recognized, right? People see this as a problem for, for democracy. Violence against women in politics is distinct from this because it's identity-based. It specifically targets women as political actors. Um, and in my book, I, I think about women in politics, not just as politicians, but also, you know, human rights defenders, voters, party members, uh, even political journalists. So it's really important to have a broad definition. Um, this type of violence is driven by patriarchal imperatives, right? It's really about reinforcing a gender hierarchy um, and its forms can be gender differentiated or not, right? It can be assassination, right? Um, but it could also be um, things very much involving sexist uh, tropes or, or sexual violence, for example. Um, but what we see is that the democratic costs of this type of violence are not well recognized, right? It's often normalized, right? Um, as just violence against women is normalized, right? Something you should just expect or something that's your own fault uh, for, for having experienced it. And I think that we should push back against that, uh, that argument. Um, so when we look at how, uh, um, how the, um, practitioners around the world are starting to, to think about this issue. We see they also adopt this broad definition. Um, so the Interparliamentary Union has done uh, several studies on uh, these experiences of, of uh, women in parliament. And you can see here that they identify four different kinds, uh, physical, psychological, and sexual violence, which come from the UN's declaration on the elimination of violence against women. Um, and then they also add economic violence, which appears in the Istanbul uh, Convention from the Council of, of Europe. And from this, you can see that um, women in, in parliaments experience all, all forms of, of violence and actually quite a troubling percentage of them report having experienced violence, um, especially psychological violence, right? Almost 82% of women in the study experience psychological violence, but between you know, one fifth and one third of the women also experience those other forms of violence as well. Um, so my book, I give some examples of what these types of violence look like in practice um, in all different parts of, of the world. Um, but I also add a fifth type of, of violence as well. Um, so I think 
probably physical violence is, is easy to understand. It could include, you know, murders or kidnappings, uh, 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 physical assaults. Um, psychological violence includes various types of threats. They could be death threats or, or rape threats. Um, but the most common uh, version of it, I think, is online abuse, right? So using um, social media channels, email, um, to attack women, to, uh, to intimidate, uh, intimidate them, and really to sort of get them to leave uh, public life uh, through that way. Um, sexual violence is, has gotten renewed attention in the wake of the Me Too movement. Um, we see more and more women talk about their experiences, um, largely, you know, as, as candidates, but also as uh, political staffers, uh, for example. Um, and then economic violence is, is really about using um, access to economic resources as a form of control and intimidation. So we could see this in, you know, the destroying of women's campaign materials, destruction of personal property. Um, you know, it's really about harming their economic livelihood to make it unsustainable to remain in, in, in politics. The, uh, the fifth type that I introduced in the book is what I call semiotic violence, which I think is probably the most widely <laughs> A widespread form of violence against women in politics, and it refers to the use of words and images to uh, degrade um, and harm uh, women. Um, and so I just give you some examples here on, on the left, but you could think about this in terms of how it's different from the other forms um, is that this is a form that, you know, these images and words could be directed at the woman, but they're actually more often directed towards the public at large to change, to affect how they, they think about women as uh, uh, legitimate political actors, right? So it's all about um, questioning their competence because they're women, questioning their qualifications because they're women. Um, and so it also includes a lot of forms of what people are increasingly calling gender disinformation, like dis, um, you know, not just Photoshopped images, but also deep fake videos that present women as being, you know, saying things that sound insane and um, really about trying to harm how people think about their capacity to serve in public life. Um, this is also an important form of violence because it's really about sending a message also to other women who might think about getting politically involved, you're going to be humiliated uh, and denigrated if you participate in, in public life. Um, okay, so then what, what can we do? Um, so there's I mean, so many examples in my, in my book. I'll just talk, give you a few. Um, but I should start by saying that awareness raising is like absolutely, it's in every chapter. I think this is like the first, you know, it's the naming, it's the raising of awareness to say that this is a problem is, is really the most vital starting point. Um, so some examples include National Democratic Institute's Global Not the Cost campaign, which is really about saying that violence is not or should not be the cost of women's political participation. Um, you'll also see more and more groups of women writing manifestos, um, open letters, calling out violence against women in politics. Um, and you see also a lot of individual women giving talks, uh, writing books about their experiences to sort of raise awareness of this as a problem and one that's unacceptable. Um, so in terms of just specific types of, of violence, um, in terms of physical violence, we see some experiments with using um, uh, uh, apps as a way of doing um, more online uh, virtual campaigning. Um, so as this example, it was used in Nigeria and uh, Afghanistan, which is about enabling women to raise money to hold their rallies using these sort of digital formats, right? So sort of um, ways to connect with voters without exposing yourself to physical violence. Um, at the UK Parliament, after the murder of Joe Cox, there was also uh, setting up of a special office in Parliament to specifically deal with these types of, uh, of threats. Um, and I think not surprisingly, they found that the disproportionate number of these threats were against women and people of color, although it was open to uh, all members of, of Parliament uh, to use their services. In terms of psychological violence, we see a lot of um, attempts to do with online abuse, individual women calling out the problem, uh, like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez here, um, but also some experiments with using things like bots to respond to the negative negativity um, and abuse directed at women politicians. So there's a, a, a group called um, a uh, parody bot where they, every time it detects, it uses machine learning to whenever there's a negative tweet or abusive tweets uh, directed at women politicians, it responds by sending out a bunch of positive tweets um, as a way of sort of counteracting that, that negativity. 
Um, we also see, and I think this is just a wonderful example um, for uh, women human rights defenders, thinking about self-care as a way of like recharging and um, sort of finding your feet again. And so this is an example from, uh, from Latin America, which is like a special retreat for women human rights uh, defenders um, to deal with that stress and, um, you know, just time to, to get away and to sort of gain some perspective on, on the issue. Um, sexual violence, uh, we see alternative reporting mechanisms. So women don't seem to have a lot of uh, faith in the existing mechanisms. Um, so we have women, for example, in the British Labor Party, which set up a website to collect women's experiences, not to like report them per se, but to help to use them to demonstrate the extent of this problem. Um, also efforts in other places to, ch to create codes of conduct um, about sexual violence in political spaces to really try to change the culture of normalizing this. Um, economic violence is one of the least developed of these types of, uh, of uh, understanding of uh, forms of violence. Um, but one example I think is worth uh, noting, this is for women human rights defenders, um, but a group called Urgent Action Fund has these rapid response grants, which are to meet some of these security concerns and needs to move, needs to, uh, to travel uh, out of certain places where, where your life is, is threatened for, for example. So it's like trying to um, provide that monetary support to continue your political activism and to be safe at the same time. And lastly, with semiotic violence, I think, you know, in some cases you're able to deal with some of these, these attacks through the legal system, um, but in a lot of places it's really about trying to change the culture that doesn't accept those types of um, degrading uh, portrayals of women. Um, so one example I have is from Argentina, where they uh, created a guide for um, uh, non-sexist and, and egalitarian language in, in political spaces as a way of sort of cultivating respect uh, and not using uh, these, these types of degrading uh, languages in political spaces. Um, and just in terms of a couple of cu cross-cutting solutions, once that go across types of violence, um, we see a growing number of international normative uh, frameworks. Uh, for example, uh, this UN General Assembly resolution on sexual harassment, which names the problem, puts it on the record in the UN system. Uh, expresses disapproval and recognize it as a problem. Um, there's also the new ILO uh, Convention 190 on uh, violence and harassment in the world of work, which includes a lot of provisions that could um, apply to politics as an unusual place of, of work. Uh, we also see efforts to legislate on the issue. This is the most common approach in Latin America. Um, the first country to have a law, standalone law, um, against political harassment and violence uh, against women was passed in Bolivia in 2012. Um, and some other initiatives ac across the region led the Organization of American States to try to develop um, a model law, so through consultations with, uh, with partners across, across the region, to, to think about ways in which the law could be mobilized to support women's participation. Um, and then we just have a few others that are more society-led cross-cutting solutions. Um, NDI created um, the Think 10 tool, which is an individual, um, individualized safety planning tool where you take a questionnaire to help you as assess your, uh, your risks and in being politically involved and then weigh steps you could take to make sure that you could participate um, uh, more freely um, in, in politics. Uh, and the one on the right is just an example from Fida Kenya, which is a, a group of female lawyers where um, during uh, recent elections, they've created an SMS reporting system that allows people to report acts of violence against candidates, against voters, and connects you to the police or to, to legal, uh, legal assistance. Um, so obviously this is an issue that's still developing, people are still talking about it. Um, so what I've done as sort of a companion to the book is to create a couple of online resources that um, sort of keep that conversation going. Uh, so I've created a, a Twitter account, VAW Politics, uh, which tries to tweet out, you know, new stories and new examples. Um, and then I also created a website that includes, you know, up-to-date list of uh, for example, research reports published by academics as well as practitioners, um, some links to solutions, um, just to, you know, um, recognize this is still a very, very much a developing uh, field. So thank you very much. And I, I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Mona. And really, uh, really exciting work and uh, great work of uh, trying to uh, bring in 
documenting the history and the developments of this phenomenon and, and also bringing about solutions and again merging between practitioners and research material. Great. We have a, we have a comments and, and questions and do, do let them keep coming uh, in the chat. We still have a bit of time uh, to do that. Uh, I have uh, questions also for the panelists. So I will start with uh, a question for um, Torge. Um, and that's a question from Diana here in Denmark, uh, a researcher asking, I wonder if you have any suggestions on, on how this configuration of the Women's League could happen. What would the role of the South African women's movement be? So Toke, that's a question for you. Uh, when I talked about the need to reconfigure the Women's League, it also ties in with what Marianne was saying in the chat, that they become at the periphery of decision making. And they take on a role of support for the main party. For me, the reconfiguring of the Women's League is that they take more an advocacy role to advocate for their issues as women in the political party. Uh, you find that the women's movement pushes. I will give uh, Zimbabwe because that's uh, where there is clear, definite pushing. In the new constitution, the women's movement pushed for proportional representation that gave 60 women political uh, parliament seats without campaigning kind of thing. And they've been pushing for 50-50. But the women within the political parties have not equally as much. What I feel is needed is for a clear feminist and women's issue agenda to be a common link between the women's movement and the women in political parties so that they have strategies for support and for pushing and for taking certain things because sometimes women as they sit in their political seats are fearful of certain things which the women's movement is not. And there should be a way of sneaking it into the women's movement and let the women's movement push and at the same time protect the women before they get the courage of saying not in my name. Thank you, Toke. And I'm sure, Mona, you also would like to add to this. We also have a question related to this from Marianne. On, on the women's wing uh, within the parties, how to, uh, should they become stronger uh, to influence, uh, help uh, ensure women's influence and position uh, instead of staying at the margin of uh, political decisions happening in the party. So the function and the structure as, as the most parties are now. Some reflection from your side, Mona. Uh, yeah, no, I think this is, um a really interesting and important issue. And um, it gives me an opportunity to um, share something I didn't mention in the presentation, which is that, um, you know, we don't have that much data on this, this problem, but the studies that exist show that um, the most common perpetrators of violence against women in politics are members of their own political parties um, and also their own relatives, right? So it's actually just like violence against women, it's perpetrated by people usually that women know, right? Um, and so there's a, a study I participated in that with NDI that looked specifically at violence against women and political parties that try to open this up a little bit. And, um, you know, it, what, what that research seemed to suggest was that women in the party talk amongst themselves, but they find it's very difficult to be able to 
um, bring up this problem because of the political gap I mentioned before, because talking about this problem in your own party makes your party look bad. There's a lot of pressure to remain quiet, right? Um, and this is, you know, with sexual harassment, but also things like intimidating you to, to not run as a candidate, to give up your seat to a male colleague. Um, and so it becomes really difficult to, to address this because of a party loyalty or pressure from people that you care about and, you know, supposedly respect, right? Um, and I think that women's, women's wings could play a key role in here, but they also very, you know, it's very challenging position to be in, right? How to, how to deal with this, this type of issue. And I, I don't really have a solution for this, except for some efforts by some political parties to change their, you know, codes of conduct or pledges, if you're a member, right, to, to adhere to certain codes of conduct. But it's very rare that someone be thrown out of the political party for this kind of, uh, of behavior, as we've seen in, in a number of political parties have tried to, to do this. Um, so I just think this is a very challenging play, position to be in where you want to promote women's issues, but you also face issues of partisan loyalty. Thank you, Mona. And maybe, Dill, you will have reflection also now that you've heard Mona's uh, presentation. You just have to unmute yourself, Dill. Yes. Um, thank you, Lisbeth. Uh, on, uh, you know, falling back on the women's wing to have our, you know, what you call say, um, from the perspective of uh, my uh, parliament, witness parliament here, since uh, the numbers are very low, I mean, the women uh, parliamentarians are, women parliamentarians number is very low. Uh, it's not very possible to have a separate women's wing. And also uh, the number uh, as such is low. On top of that, when we come from different backgrounds and also the age group varies a lot, you know, we have as young as 26 year old women parliamentarian and I guess I'm the oldest I'm going to be 48 soon so the thinking level varies and we cannot think at the same level so we cannot form a separate women's wing within the parliament in our context but yes uh, what we have done um, in the past two years my experience is we have uh, outsourced you know um, falling back to, to you know organizations outside the parliament so that's how we have uh, coped up and uh, it's true, uh, women, uh, you know, do get subjected to all sorts of, you know, violence, uh, especially like Mona mentioned, um, you know, the, the violators sometimes or most of the time are our own colleagues in the same party, you know, and I, I truly uh, endorse that <laughs> because uh, we have, we also face that sometimes, but, but uh, I've been, uh, I've been quite successful in, Con, uh, conveying messages to my male colleagues that you know certain things are not acceptable at all and uh, perhaps they have found uh, you know taken me as being too strong a personality when I make sure that I convey such messages to them but I feel happy uh, when you know slowly um, not overnight but with time no? uh, over weeks and months I see changes in them in, in their dealing with the women colleagues. So that way, uh, even if we cannot have um, women's wing within the parliament, if each woman, a woman, you know, parliamentarian stands up to the principles that we believe in, in trying to, you know, what you call communicate to us by our male colleagues, things will work out. Uh, that's how I take. Thank you, Lisbeth. Thank you so much, Dil. Um, Mona, going back to, to one of your earlier slides where you talked about the different gaps, uh, I think, which I think is a both very important and fascinating way of trying to, uh, to uh, cluster uh, the different aspects of, of violence against women in politics. You mentioned as the cognitive gap of that it's, it's just part of the game. Um, and that therefore both men and women uh, do not come out, do not speak um, and have a perception that that's normality. What to do about such a perception and uh, a cognitive gap? Uh, I think this is where awareness raising is, um, you know, it sounds like a like both, you know, very comprehensive and very vague, right? At the same at the same time, um, you know, and I, I'm 
this is actually what made it very challenging to start working on this this issue because people weren't calling it violence or they weren't calling it violence against women in politics. Um, but once you give people the language, you start to see them use it. And uh, it can refer to um, a New York Times article that was written a couple of years ago in the run-up to the 2018 elections in the United States. And it was on this abuse and intimidation of women candidates. And the, um, the journalist said, you know, as I was trying to ask women about their experiences with it, they were like, no, 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 you know, I've never experienced that. And then when they were sort of gotten a few definitions, they were like, oh yeah. <laughs> and then there was like a huge long list of things that they had experienced. And I, I see that written, you know, in um, reports, you know, uh, um, uh, other journalists, uh, a practitioner reports around the world that it's really about not having a way to talk about it, right? And so, so I think about this as the problem with no, with no name, right? And so without a name, it's hard to really do anything uh, against it, right? To sort of focus efforts and to say, actually, you and I have this shared experience, right? And we, we could work together to, to try to uh, uh, address it. Um, and this is really what was part of the, the Not the Cost campaign, because you just kept hearing, like, like if women want to be politically active, they're just going to have to deal with the the threats and the abuse and you know some of some of the hostility and conflict is 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 democratically helpful right you should hold your your elected officials to account right for for bad performance or are not representing their their um constituents well but it, i think it crosses a line when it's it's not um it doesn't contribute to democratic debate when it's about personal uh personalized uh, attacks right um that are they just they just don't um it, it just really is nothing that that contributes to to democratic uh, uh discourse and so um that's really where i think the work that's being done by academics and practitioners is trying to to give us a language and and to help us start to denormalize this this problem is something we shouldn't uh, shouldn't accept. And actually, one of the things that the cover of my book I don't know if you saw it, but it includes um, uh, a series of different hashtags that try to, uh, to to draw broad attention. So there's not the cost, but then there's like uh, this is not working, um, not in my parliament. Obviously, various forms of Me Too, Congress, and things like this that are really trying to to do that and to sort of call it out and denormalize it as a as a thing that women should expect to, to face. And that's, you know, just part of the game. When you've been, uh, Togo, you have a comment? Just unmute yourself, please. Um, I, I have a comment, which is a question. My comment is how much of the cognitive gap is also about the denial that women have. I am in a higher place, I am a decision maker. I can't be seen as someone who is violated. Remember that uh, sometimes when we talk about violence against women, we make it as if it happens in poor families, in poor conditions. And I always say the difference between me and the woman who is in the township is that I can buy powder and um, put makeup and you can't see it and she doesn't have. So as uh, Mona was talking, I wondered how much of the denial camouflages the problem as well? Thank you for that reflection, Mona. You want to give a comment back? No, I, I think I, I think that's a really important um, a, a point. I think a lot of that is about self-presentation. Um, you know, women say, well, I'm strong, I can handle it, right? It's not really a big, a big deal. Um, but one of the most fascinating things I found in my interviews and colleagues' interviews that people I've talked to is that there's a willingness to say, well, it doesn't happen to me, but I know what happens to my female colleagues. And um, that's often used as way, it may, that may be true, but I think it's also a way of saying like, it's a problem, I'm just not gonna tell you. <laughs> 
against me, but I know it's an issue. And so um, if we look at the Interparliamentary Union survey, it asked women, did you experience this yourself? Or do you know of colleagues that have experienced it? In each of those cases, it's pretty close, the percentages of women who say that, except for sexual violence. It's something like 20% of women say they personally experience sexual violence or sexual harassment, but like 35% say that they've seen their female colleagues experience it. And I think that's really interesting because I think that the reality is probably closer to what they say they know their colleagues, right? It's really hard to, to, to recognize it in yourself or to admit it to, uh, to, to other people. Um, but at the same time, I think we, we win something when people are saying, well, it's happening to other people. It's a problem in the system. I think at least it's helping us to have this conversation. Um, but, you know, it plays with your sense of self. Um, another thing I've, I've noticed that, you know, obviously more feminist women are more willing to talk about this because they accept a gender equality framework, right? They realize that there's, <laughs> there's patriarchy. Um, and I think women from more traditional backgrounds, they think of a harder time recognizing this or being willing to speak up about it because, um, because I think it's sort of part of the conservative ideology more, more generally, but doesn't mean that they experience it, le you know, any less than more feminist, uh, progressive women. No, I agree. Uh, thank you so much. We have a, both a comment and a, a question, and I will invite you for the last round of questions uh, here that we have another a few minutes before the end of this webinar. We have a comment and a, a question from our uh, good colleague, Punchok, uh, that we partner with in Bhutan, saying that violence against women in politics goes unrecognized by the affected women and is often overlooked by everyone. Yet we see both blatant and subtle forms of it. Would you agree that women in politics need to be encouraged to bravely shout out for the benefit of everyone? And I'll both let, uh, I'll give the word to you, Toko, Dil and Monat for a, for a comment on that. Toko? I do agree, they need to be encouraged, but they also need awareness raising and support that deals with their insecurities and the threats they feel and the fear that causes them to hide the problem for themselves. Thank you. And Dil, a short comment from your side. Um, yes, uh, women uh, parliamentarians need to be encouraged to shout out and, you know, make their problems public. Um, to a much extent, I have done it, I should say. Uh, I did face some sort of intimidation. Um, and then uh, what I did over time, you, you know, initially I was a little bit low, but with time I realized uh, I will just face the problem, the face the fear, you know. So I did what I was told not to do. <laughs> and then uh, I think things uh, improved with time. So I guess uh, women uh, parliamentarians should learn, like I uh, submitted earlier, stand up for yourself, no? And not get um, what you call subdued by the intimidation that comes uh, in the process. Thank you. Thanks, Dil and uh, Mona. Um. Oh, I, I, I think that would be wonderful if, if it happened. Um, this is also why I think, um, you know, we think about the cost to, 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 to speaking out about this um, in terms of who, who speaks out. So the, the most prominent female politicians to speak out about this issue often do it after they've retired from politics, they've withdrawn from public life. Um, so if you look at things like, like Julia Gillard, for example, the Australian prime minister, she wrote about it in a book after she left office. Hillary Clinton, she wrote it in a book after uh, you know, she didn't win the electoral vote in the last, last election. And Hillary Clinton actually says, you know, like if I'd called it out at the time, people would have just heaped more abuse on me, right? And to say that she can't handle it. Um, and so she says, like, I wonder what would have happened, though, if I did, right? Because I think that she would feel justified um, in, in doing that. Um, and, you, you know, you're currently seeing sort of the struggle, you know, in the United States, um, just to bring it to my own country, with members of the so-called squad, right? So Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Anna Presley, 
Ilhan Omar and, and Rashida Tlaib, that they are, um, you know, so, so attacked, relentlessly attacked, and they are very bravely sort of sticking together. So the four of them work together to try to bring the issue into public debate. Um, and they joined together with Representative Jackie Speer, uh, who worked on the Me Too Congress bill, um, to introduce a House resolution uh, recognizing violence against women in politics as a global phenomenon, including in the United States. Um, and I think it was, there was a strength in numbers by not just being the one person by yourself. I think it was finding friends, right? Kindred spirits who will work with you. I think, you know, they still attract the abuse, but then they have each other, right? Um, and their support from, from one another. And I think maybe that's the model that, that we're talking about. I think um, with support, I think you're more likely to be able to, to do it and to weather the storm for, for speaking out. Thanks, Mona. We are approaching the end of our webinar and uh, we've touched upon a, a huge issue, a complex and difficult issue. And uh, you spent quite a while writing this book, Mona, and I know our other panelists and participants here in the webinar works with this problem every day. Hopefully you have all been a bit inspired. We've tried to uh, invite for sharing uh, ideas and recommendations um, to, uh, to, to the problem. Uh, we of course encourage people to, uh, to, uh, to use Mona's book, to use each other and to uh, continue the important work. I think we all have an obligation, be it practitioner or be it academics, researchers, to push uh, forward and give courage to the women who are in politics and more important to young women thinking of or trying to get into politics. We need them and we want them. And at least from the side of the IPD, we will continue to, uh, to use our efforts in supporting uh, getting more women into politics globally. I really want to thank uh, our panelists, Dil from Bhutan, Toko based in South Africa, and Juliet, unfortunately, technical challenges of uh, access to uh, electricity cut her off today, but we will make sure to share her, her comments and presentations with all of you among the audience. And thank you to you, Mona, and congratulations with your book. Um, we will make sure that we will also share the link uh, on our YouTube uh, uh, video so that for those who um, didn't get all of the great points that were raised today, have an opportunity to, to, to do that and you can share with your colleagues. We hope to get back to you at another event because I think this is, uh, there's a lot of work to do for all of us in our different spheres of work. I hope you will, uh, just before we end, again, use the chat function and share your reflections of what your takeaways from today, one or two points that you think you've, 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 you've captured that inspires you or that you can use in your work or something that is a, um, a uh, something you want to highlight for us uh, working with it every day that we should be reminded of in our work or for the researchers in their work that they need to continue doing or looking at. We welcome all kinds of comments and, and reflections um, before we, we end um, this webinar. But thank you so much. We've had participations uh, from all the way from, uh, from Asia, the Philippines, uh, Jakarta, uh, Bhutan, uh, to uh, to the um, to the east coast of uh, the US, uh, Africa, and Europe. Thank you so much for for all of you participating, and do give us a few uh, shout outs in our chat function before you leave uh, this this meeting. Thank you so much, and finally, thank you also to uh, Demo Finland and the uh, Olaf Palme International Institute for uh, this collaboration. Thank you so much, and do uh, give us a um, a hide hideout or a, a comment in our in our chat function before you leave the meeting.